Everything's fine. Everything's fine. We're all good here. We're fine. Everything's fine. How are you? All right, my friends. Um, I'll give it a minute because I gave it three. Uh, it'll take me. A f it'll take a minute probably to get people here for a second. But um, how's everybody doing? I am. Uh, I'm gonna be in Psalm. <laughs> I'm gonna be in Psalm 119 tonight, as usual. If you have your Bibles, please do turn to Psalm 119. I will be in verses, let me see, 29, 129 to verse 136, the Hebrew letter Pei, um, and uh, Lisa is is not with us tonight, um, she, she, she is, she's here, she's still on the planet, but um, she is with, she's with her family uh, in the great, in the great north, um, and so, so she's up there, so we won't be having a worship in that sense, unfortunately. Um, but we will be having a, a little bit of the word. Now, I will say, caveat, my eye may be distracted by this particular image. Um, I got my, <laughs> I got, I got my child on the old baby monitor. Lisa, if she does watch this, she's going to need to know this is happening. Um, that even though I'm in the garage, I am, I'm in tuned with the baby. Okay. Um, so in tune with the baby, everything's going to be Okay. If for some reason I'm like, hey, everybody, I'll just be right back. Uh, it's because something's going on with the baby. Um, but I just want you to see, honey, I'm in tune with the baby. Okay? I see the baby. I, I am the baby. I look like a baby with a beard. Um, so Michaela's back in California. It's a big deal. And uh, Lisa's gone uh, to, to, to Washington with her family. Uh, also uh, a big deal. And, uh, and we're in Psalm 119, the biggest deal, maybe, okay? So Psalm 119, verses 129 to 136. Let me say a prayer. Let me sing the docs, and let's jump into the scripture. Um, and, uh, and we'll just let God be God. Amen? All right. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to teach your word. Uh, <laughs> I do pray that you would help my, uh, my children be well uh, here and at peace with each other and <laughs> with you. Um, help uh, Haddon to get a good sleep and a good rest. Uh, and I do pray that you would bless those who are traveling, uh, those who are returning or, or heading to return soon, um, that there will be traveling mercies for all those who are on the, on the roads. Um, and that you'd be, yeah, in the word in our time together tonight, that the Spirit would bind our hearts together, that you would reveal yourself to us tonight in this place. And we just thank you, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to be here. So we ask for a blessing on the service, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, by way of announcements, uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, as always, 7 o'clock for the men's study, the women's study, and the men's study. And uh, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock worship with uh, Miss Michaela Mitchell. And, uh, and then uh, 10.30, of course, the word with uh, Pastor John. And then uh, if you want to support the ministry of Zoe, um, you could go to zoechurch.com and uh, hook up the PayPal donate button there. Um, or if you want to do a regular thing through Zelle or whatever, you can contact uh, John directly or myself if you don't have John's info. Uh, but we do really appreciate it. Uh, we really appreciate the support for the ministry. Um, we're going on just a little over a year now in this format. And by God's grace, I mean, that's always been our story, by God's grace, Year in, year out, by God's grace. Year in, year out, by God's grace. We keep uh, we keep chugging along. So, so thank you, Lord, and uh, and and thank you guys uh, for supporting the ministry. Uh, tonight we're in Psalm 119, uh, which is a series of 22 stanzas based on the Hebrew alphabet. One letter from the Hebrew alphabet for each stanza. 22 stanzas, 22 strophes. If you're a poetics person. Uh, and tonight we are in the, uh, the stanza beginning in verse 129. And there we read. No, wait, I'm supposed to sing the doxology. Uh, where's my wife? Where's my life? Okay, let's sing the doxology uh, and then we'll get into the word. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay. 
Psalm 119, verse 129. Your laws are wonderful. No wonder I obey them. The teaching of your word gives light, so even the simple can understand. I pant with expectation, longing for your commands. Come and show me your mercy, as you do for all who love your name. Guide my steps by your word, so I will not be overcome by evil. Ransom me from the oppression of evil people. Then I can obey your commandments. Look upon me with love. Teach me your decrees. Rivers of tears gush from my eyes because people disobey your instructions. My friends, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, the father of history is a phrase that was used to describe Herodotus, early Greek, ancient Greek historian, the father of history. Um, Herodotus uh, lived uh, sort of just prior to, uh, and entering into, but just prior to sort of the golden age of Athens in the 5th century uh, BC or BCE. And Herodotus was sort of the first in the Western world, we could say, maybe, uh, who just sort of copiously recorded um, sort of information about cultures, information about peoples, places, geography, architecture, Myths, legends, uh, stories about the gods, stories about beliefs in other cultures, in their gods, stories about the afterlife, stories about how people spent their money, stories about how people decided who would get married to whom in different cultures, stories about wars and rumors of wars, especially wars. Herodotus's famous work is the Persian Wars, describing the incredible events of the wars between ancient empire of Persia and the ascendant empire of Greece, or empires of Greece, really Athens and later Sparta as well. Um, Herodotus is the one we get uh, incredible accounts, for example, of the Battle of Thermopylae with the Spartan 300, um, with the valiant sort of dying to a man, last stand, holding back the Persians as long as possible, and in fact uh, successfully um, holding them back long enough for the other Greeks to sort of rally um, and be able ultimately in the Persian Wars, shockingly, to rebuff, not defeat, but rebuff the Persians from taking over Greece. Um, Herodotus, of course, in that context gives us the famous Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, not Battle of Thermopylae, but the Battle of Marathon. In the fields of Marathon, um, Herodotus tells us about this incredible fight between the Greek hoplites and this incredibly much, much, much larger Persian army, just sophisticated ranged attacks on horseback, just overwhelming odds. And yet the Greek hoplites rushing at the Persians so quickly, closing the space, shocking victory at the Battle of Marathon. Tells us about the runner who runs 26 miles from the plains of Marathon to the city of Athens and with his sort of last breath shouts out that Athens has been victorious in the battle, that Persians have been defeated and then his heart explodes or he has a heart attack and dies, uh, the legends tell us. What I love about Herodotus though is he's not just sort of a, an apologist for the Greeks, of course he is, he loves his civilization. He loves his people. He loves, he, he thinks it's these, these, these victories, especially the unexpected ones, it is incredible. And he does think that the Greeks have a special place in the history of the ancient world, the history of the world, um, and, and for fair reasons on, on some level. But ancient history to that point is largely written by kings about kings and how great kings were. Herodotus has is much more interested in everything. And the reason I love reading Herodotus is because he is curious about the world. He's not just uh, writing screeds about uh, how absurd all of the non-Greeks are uh, and these sort of celebrants or these incredible sort of praise encomiums about how incredible his people are. It's not just a pure sort of jingoism, right? What I love about Herodotus is he is interested in other cultures. He's interested in the lives of the Persians, the, the famous enemies of Greece. You know, he has account after account after account about how incredible their art and their architecture and how incredible their cities were and how incredible their sort of medicine was and how they took care of their sick. And he's just absolutely 
fascinated with the world. It leads people to critique him because he'll mix in myth and legend with what we would think of as ordinary causal history. This led to that, that battle happened this way. But he'll also say, oh, and I heard, <laughs> I heard uh, that the gods descended in the form of a she-wolf here and did this, that, and the other thing. And you'll be like, seriously, Herodotus? But what Herodotus is great with is he'll say, I don't know if this is true, and it probably, <laughs> probably isn't. I don't know if this is true, but this is a really good story. And then he'll just tell you the story anyway. So his way of doing history, like, kind of like, maybe has a little funk uh, for our sensibilities about history being this sort of objective, you know, sort of, I'm not a part of any of this. Um, these are just a record of informative, you know, causal events. Um, but Herodotus, what I love about Herodotus is he is just fascinated with the world. Uh, I, I think that as the postmortems come in on evangelicalism, I think one of the greatest parts of our failures is going to be that we were not curious and we were not fascinated with the world. That we were not people who were filled with awe and wonder at the world that the Lord had made. That we were not people filled with awe and wonder at other people. I think, I think the record of evangelicalism is going to be that we were just jingoists coming and going. That we, were so, we got so obsessed with our rightness and our way and our our control and our design and our, our what we did and what our culture and our subculture was that we just we no longer cared about other people and how they lived and how they thought and what and what they read and what they loved and how they conducted the, their ordinary lives and what they believed in it, 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 you know like i think it's going to come back the postmortem on evangelicalism is going to come back that we just were not amazed we were not interested we we didn't we didn't we weren't curious about the world anymore that we just lost that kind of sense of awe, of, of wonder that Herodotus even had. That, that one of the great sort of Greeks are great, and here let me tell you all about the Greeks. Even Herodotus had so much more wonder and curiosity and interest than, than I think uh, this last generation has, has proven in our subculture. And I, I think part of our recovery project about how to sort of have a form of Christianity that can have longevity to it, that can survive, that is actually real and robust. I think, I think it's going to surprise us maybe where the Lord seeks to ground it. And I think one of the places that has been overlooked, overlooked time and time again, overlooked constantly and especially in, in evangelicalism, is the place of wonder. Uh, the psalm that we have tonight, the section of Psalm 119, I should say, that we have tonight begins with wonder. Um, I, know of a, I know of an ancient order of educators who had a Latin phrase that said, wisdom is birthed in wonder. Uh, and the psalmist opens with this verse, 129, your law, speaking of the word of the Lord, the decrees, the commandments, the direction of the Spirit of God through his scripture, your laws are wonderful. They are wonderful. And what's so interesting to me is that somebody who is steeped in them, soaked in them, so familiar with them. What's the phrase we use? Familiarity often breeds contempt. You know, when you become so used to something, you tend to make it small. Uh, if you get so used to your spouse, you tend to think you know everything about them and that they're this. And then especially if you're in a disagreement, well, you know, she does it. Well, you know, he's always, do you know, well, you know, you know. And in one of those moments, you know, every once in a while, you should be like, uh, you don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, like a human being, even the people that are closest to us, especially, we tend to shrink them down and be like, well, you know, you know. And we lose awe, we lose wonder, we lose respect, we lose curiosity, we lose interest in the world, we lose interest in people, we lose interest in life because we reduce it. Well, you know, you, you know, you know. And we lose interest in our own culture. We lose interest in, in our country. We lose interest in the things that we ought to be fascinated by. And the psalmist starts from this place and he says, your laws are wonderful. And wonderful, I mean, think about what that word actually means. It means something that is, is more than I can grasp, but it is astonishing. It is, it's category breaking. It's sort of seam splitting on my, my understanding of the world. It's the exact opposite of familiarity breeds contempt, right? He is familiar with the Lord's word and his laws, and that familiarity has led him to an ever-deepening sense of wonder. That's an incredible place to start, to say that as you grow with the Lord, 
part of the signal of our growth in the Lord is that the Lord's word should lead us into deeper places, not of, well, you, oh, you know, you know, you, you know what, you know what Levitic is all, you know what Paul is all, you know what the letters are all, about. you know the gospel story, you know, come on, you know, we've all read it before. Instead, he says, your laws are wonderful. They, the more he reflects on them, the more he incorporates them into his life through obedience, the greater and more expansive does his mind and his reflection and his life and his understanding of the Lord become. It's filled with wonder. He's, he's just, he's interested, he's curious, he's, he's drawn to the depths because he can't see the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the scripture, even though he knows it. I think for evangelicalism, in so many ways, familiarity bred contempt. We, we, we knew the teachings of Christ so much, we actually, in our lives, refused them. We, like, despised them. They're, they were so familiar, we were bored with them. We had this great habit of making God very, very small and then dismissing his agenda and replacing it with a different one, namely ours. And what I find so interesting is not just that Psalm... 119 verses 129 to 136 begins in a place of wonder, but that the psalmist sees wonder as motivation for obedience. Wonder as motivation for obedience, or you could say appreciation, right? Like a lot of times we think about our motives, you know, we think about what, what motivates a person in the spiritual life. What motivates you to follow the Lord? What motivates you to dive into the word? What motivates you? Sometimes people are motivated by guilt. Sometimes they're, oh, I know I should do this. I just feel bad all the time. So oh, I got this. Uh, sometimes people are motivated by fear. Like, oh man, the, the other shoe's going to drop. You know, the Lord's going to, the Lord's going to knock me down. He's going to take something away. You know, if I don't, if I don't make sure I'm in the word, you know, if I don't make sure I'm like really tracking with him, you know, um, you know, or even worse, like, like what if, you know, what if I fall away or like, what if something, what, what if, you know, what if hell or <laughs> what if, what if punishment, what if, Sometimes we're motivated by fear. Sometimes we're motivated by, by power, um, especially in contemporary Christianity. Um, you know, I know maybe if I believe it or if I name it, I can claim it. And maybe if I, if I believe it and I, and I sort of speak it into my life, I speak it into life, sort of a power of positive, like, you know, thinking slash Bible roulette slash Jesus bless me, I need money slash I just... I just want a successful business slash, you know, like maybe we're motivated by the desire for power or success. Um, maybe we're motivated by something more complex, like the desire for safety. Um, like uh, I want to stick close to the Lord because, you know, I want a life that's like really, I, want, I don't want bad things that happen to me. You know what I mean? Like, um, I don't need to be rich, but I just don't want bad things to happen to me. So I want to stick close to the Lord because, you know, I know like, you know, he's going to keep all the bad things away. You know, it's like the Lord's like the sort of the, the, the great gated fence of your little, you know, suburban life, right? So motives are really interesting. And, and our, I think this last year, we've, we've discovered maybe to our chagrin many of our motives because we've had trouble maybe following through or we had trouble sort of tapping those reservoirs of where my motivation comes from for going to church when I don't actually go to church or, or from being in uh, accountability, you know, discipleship kind of groups when that's not easy to pull off or, you know, or, or staying again in the word or meditating on the word or praying when life is still as busy or as challenging and maybe more challenging and busy than it's ever been, right? Like, our motives are, are, are becoming a central thing on which we have to reckon with our motives. What are, you, what are your motives? What are your motives for walking with the Lord? What are your motives for being in the Word? Um, I think every time in my life I was just motivated because I wanted, to, I wanted to be the person who knew things, you know? I like to know things. I'm, like, really interested in knowing things. And I think especially in my youth, you know, I could see that was sort of paired with, like, a desire to be, like, the person who had an answer, you know? The person who, like, wasn't going to be wasn't going to be astonished. I mean, wasn't, it wasn't about wonder. You'd be like, I want to have the Bible. I want to be the Bible answer, man, right? <laughs> that, that was already taken as a title. But, you know, like, I want to be the guy who people would be like, hey, what about this? And I'd be like, ba-bam, you know? Um, I don't want to be the guy who's like, no, I've never heard of that. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, I don't know what motives. Motives can be really complex. But what's amazing to me about where this, this strophe opens is that the psalmist is motivated by wonder, motivated by wonder what a glorious motivation he goes because because your laws are wonderful 
No wonder I obey them. In other words, the more he looks into the word, the more he's astonished by what he sees, the more as he meditates, reflects, prays, obeys, he sees the life of the word, the more he's motivated to obey the word. <laughs> like it's such a, it's such an awesome place for motivation. Like if what motivated you or I in our walk with the Lord was just wonder, it would be such a healthy thing. If we're just like, I'm just like, God's just amazing. Like when I look at the word, I'm just like overwhelmed with how incredible it is, how fascinating, how deep, how challenging, how robust, how beautiful, how expansive, how like, you know, if that, of course I want to obey him. Like I barely can sort of like fathom like what I'm even like reflecting on when I think about God and time and eternity and his love for me and the redemption of humanity through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, if you were actually to reflect on the Lord and the word and his commands and his decrees, his laws, his promises, his fulfillments, and you saw that how wonderful the word was. What an incredible place. The psalmist puts it as a central place of our motivation. That we would be motivated by wonder to obey. We would be motivated to obey by wonder. If I'm right about the postmortem on evangelicalism, that one of the greatest sort of failures was a loss of wonder, um, then, it, then it follows, uh, based on the psalmist's logic, that obedience also failed, right? That if we were no longer sort of filled with awe and wonder at the Word of God and presence of God and the reality of God, but we were sort of so familiar, we, we had, you know, we had that down, um, then no wonder I didn't obey, right? Like, if I thought I knew it all, no wonder I wasn't obeying Jesus. If I, if I thought, like, if I thought it was dull, boring, or I, I already was familiar with it and it was no longer interesting to me or captivating, or, you know, if I thought it was just sort of, yeah, I, I get it, you know, it's fine. Um, no wonder I didn't obey, right? Like, you could flip that on its head and say, man, if you don't have wonder, if you don't, if you don't see the wonder of the Lord and his word, you know, obedience is going to be motivated by something else. But the psalmist, the psalmist thinks that wonder is a category central for your motivation to obey. Like, your obedience would flow from that sense of wonder. Um, again, I think just that, that temptation in our contemporary forms of Christianity, that we have sort of reduced everything so much that we actually ended up thinking it wasn't much. Like we reduced it so much, got so familiar with everything that we actually made it so small we were no longer even that interested or compelled by it. And so our obedience and everything else started to slip and we started to, you know, other motivations, other agendas started to come in pretty easily from there. But I just want to recover this idea that wonder, that, that the marvelous things of the Lord, that his word is not just sort of a, a riddle to be solved or, um, I don't know, a schema to be memorized uh, it's not just sort of a, uh, um, I don't know, a, a, a code to hack for blessing or, a, or a, a gated, you know, thing around my life for protection of safety, you know, uh, and convenience. Uh, but that the word is more and more and other than anything I can quite grasp. It, that it's astonishing. Um, you know, in the same way that Herodotus is, is, is just so fascinated by other cultures and other people and other places that we would be so fascinated by our study of the Lord and his word, by his commandments. Like, man, why does the Lord say it that way? Why does he say it, you know, what, he could have said it so many ways. Why does he say it that way? What is he trying to, that we would be like pushed to want to sort of like the sheep, right? Digesting it in the different stomachs that we would want to be like re-chewing, right? Like what we do, I, I do it the Tuesday nights with the guys a lot, you know, we try to rethink like, why is it phrased this way? What is going on here? Like, that's strange that it does this or like that the Lord says that in this way and this, that, that kind of, as you get further and further into, into the word of the Lord, into his commandments, into his presence in the scripture, that it, it should sort of deepen your wonder and then by deepening your wonder, motivate your obedience. I think that's just an incredibly beautiful place to start to say, if we truly appreciate it, um, the sort of beauty of the scripture, if we truly appreciated, um, if we truly stood in awe at the depths and the, and the, and the challenge and the sort of the, uh, the deep sort of 
to com- I mean, it is sort of like riddles, right? Like those who dig will find treasure. If we really believe that, we would we would never have to um, motivate ourselves through fear or to secure um, sort of a prize. We would want to be in the Word in the morning. We would want to be in the Word. We would want to talk about the Word with our family members. We would want to talk about it with our children. Not because that's what good, pious people do with their children. <laughs> you know, meep, meep, moop. Um, but because you just be like astonished, right? Like your kids can tell if you're being like, so, meep, mop moop, morality. Meep, mop moop, you know? Um, and they can also tell if you're just like, this is incredible, but think about think about what Jesus said here. Think about what he did. Like coming through uh, Holy Week this last week and talking to my son and daughter about Jesus, like I, there, I could hear it in my voice. There were times when I was like giving a lesson, like thus and therefore, meet my moop, uh, you know, this is why and this is this is what happened. You know, like, uh, you know, like I get it all. And then there was moments, there's moments when, like I was talking to, I think, uh, John, maybe it was Violet, about um, Holy Saturday, about the day that, you know, Jesus was like in the tomb, you know? And like they had all these interesting questions. Like, what was he doing in the tomb? I was like, well, he's, he was dead. But then I was thinking of the Apostles' Creed. And I was like, he went, he went down to the place of the dead. He went down, he, he, he plundered hell and preached the gospel, set captives free. I was like, well, actually, it was really busy. <laughs> and, you know, as, like, when, you ki- when my kids ask me questions that are difficult, it stirs, like, the wonder in the word. When I'm just meep, mop, moop, here's the lesson, the Jesus lesson for the day, meep, mop, moop. When I'm in meep, mop, moop mode, whoa, um, there's no wonder. It's just like, here's, here are our answers and here are things to know and memorize. I don't know. But they, could, they can tell, they can tell, and I can tell when I'm like, oh, man, you know what he was doing? <laughs> when I'm like, oh, man, when I'm like feeling the wonder of what Jesus was up to as his body lay dead in a tomb on Saturday. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, man. Because then I'm thinking, oh, and then because when he's resurrected, you know, well, you know, more than one, at least one, but uh, uh, the gospel accounts is like, and then all these graves started opening up and people were dead, started walking around, entered into the sea. Like, there, there's more going on in the, in the, the meat mop moop mode of, like, uh, of Holy Week, right? Like, there are nooks and crannies where you're like, wait, what? And I could, I could feel it when I was, like, articulating it to my children that when I was, like, I was in it and I was, like, a child, you know, just being like, guys, he's amazing. The Lord's amazing. And they could hear my tone changes. You know, I sound like a person. You know what I mean? Um, and Because that's what wonder does, you know. Like, one of the great things we lost was we lost personhood. We became agendas. We became causes. When we went to church, we became roles. Like, what do you do at church? It's like, I don't know. Uh, I do this, I do that. It's like, okay, so then now, nah, yeah, you, so you really committed to your church because you do a bunch of stuff. Like, we became all sorts of other things uh, when it came to church or when it came to the Lord, um, when we lost wonder. We just became, you know, sort of like, yeah, we became jobs or roles or something. We became something small, but something clear and maybe something that was like, yeah, we became like, you know, a nonprofit, you know, thing who does this or whatever. Um, but I can tell when I am experiencing the wonder of the Lord and the wonder of his word. Uh, I'm just a person. I'm not a person in control. I'm not a person with a plan. I'm not a person who's moving an agenda or a cause forward. I'm not a person who's like, I'm just like, I'm an astonished young child who is just talking about how amazing the Lord is. Like, why does he love us so much? Why does he love us so much? Have you thought about that? Why does he love you so much? Like, when you have wonder, you you have the the beginnings. You have a, a real shot at being a person instead of being an agenda or being a vision or being a, you know, I don't know, a prophecy. Or, um, when you have wonder, you could be a person. I, I still think, I think it'll... I think this will be true. I still think the most convincing, one of the most convincing postmortems on evangelicalism was what Pastor John uh, talked with me about at the end of the first season of the podcast, um, was that we lost our personhood. We lost um, 
a connection to real life. We lost a connection to people. We lost a curiosity about our neighbors and their lives. Um, we lost an interest and a love for ordinary things. Um, you know, a person is someone who has skills and interests and uh, a person has relationships and uh, different kinds of attachments to people and obligations and responsibility. Like a person is a really wondrous sort of category that the Lord has made. Um, but uh, oftentimes we just sort of take away personhood and we just become these little selves, these thin little selves that are like up to something. And then when the something doesn't work or we don't get our way, we're like, Mah! and then we can become a mad self. We're like, Mah! why did you make me not get what I want? Mah! But it's like, if you're a person, you're not meh and you're not meat mop moop. You're, you're like sitting there and you're just like, man, you're, you're enjoying a fullness of life because you have a life. Somebody asked me uh, not too long ago, like, what do I need to be a good pastor? And I go, you need to be a person. <laughs> I, 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 I was like, you need to have a life. You need to have a life. Like, you need to read and enjoy the world, you know? Like, for me, one of the things the Lord did is he sort of rescued me from being um, just a self trying to be a pastor or, or whatever by giving me this other life. Like, every time I moved toward ministry, he added... Uh, you're also going to have this job. You know? <laughs> he added, you're going to go to school. And I'm like, but that's not ministry school necessarily. And he'd be like, and you're going to do it anyway. He just kept, he, he made so sure that I, I had the chance at developing personhood, that I, I had the chance of being interested in the world, not because I could do something about everything or not because it was like a part of my agenda um, or a part of myself, but because I was a person in the world. And so he like, let me study literature. He's let me now become a history teacher, ancient history teacher. And, and I just feel like so rescued from, from having become something much smaller and more prone to a lot of things that I would have been prone to because of, he kept giving me personhood. Jess mentioned last week, um, thank you, Jess, by the way, for preaching for me. Um, Jess mentioned last week um, the James Harriet sort of stories, um, books, and those have been something that have been a, an astonishing place of wonder. Lisa's tapped into that even more fully than I have, and she's always like, oh, do you remember that? Do you remember that one story? And I'll be like, kind of, but I realize, like, I, you know, I'm always sort of half listening, and I'm like, I know that's great. Um, so when she laughed, of course, uh, I was like, oh, like as a nostalgic, my wife's away. I want to be connected to my wife. So I, I've just been listening to James Harriet on Audible because the reader is amazing. Uh, I've just been listening to James Harriet, sort of this North English country vet. Um, and, and James Harriet has, an, has a simple hobbit life kind of thing, uh, which is what personhood looks like. And it's ordinary and it's attentive. And he's like, he's fascinated with people and he clearly loves animals and people and his attention to detail, and he's not always just trying to fix everything. He's not always trying to like make somebody do something. He's just sort of talking, he's describing. He's like Herodotus, he's just looking around. He's just like, this little village, this little town is beautiful, it's so interesting. These people with their funny personalities and their little tics and stuff, it's, like, it's just wonderful, it's sort of fascinating. And I've been like really blessed by that the last couple of days, um, that I've, I decided to put all the other things that I listened to away for a bit and just have some time with James Harriet, Jess, and then Lisa gave me sort of this excuse to be like, I'm just gonna go back to that place. And what astonishes me about that is, is, is it's wonder. It's just wonder in ordinary things, wonder in the beauty of, of life as life, wonder in just the, how incredible people are for just being people. And I'm bringing this full circle, don't think I got distracted. Um, the wonder of the word that the word is not ordinarily sort of familiar boring you know oh i know what that means uh, I, know, I know that i know that that's not that's you don't know that that's not true the word is wonderful it's filled with wonder it can be ordinary wonder it could be cosmic wonder it could be moral wonder like what astonishing what, what god has declared good and bracing what he has declared evil um you know it could be it could be category shattering how how do angels exist what is an angel it could be category shattering how are my prayers being heard right now in the throne room of god where is the throne where is heaven it could be sort of ontologically shattering how are human beings 
uh, at the center of God's work in reality when they're when we are so so small. Uh, it could be Psalm eight, sort of shattering that wonder, the attentiveness. If you could look at the world the way James, if you could look at the Word, the way James Harriet looks at the farmer whose cow he is trying to help calve or. Um, or, or, or the way that Herodotus looked at even the Persians, the enemy, you know, just like fascinating. Oh, and this other thing, a brilliant thing they do is how they uh, conduct their, you know. I mean, if you could look at the word with that kind of level of fascination, with that kind of level of sort of humble awe, um, if you could look at the Lord, if you could look at the gospel, if you could look at Jesus's teachings, uh, this morning, my kids and I were talking, we were going through a beatitude a day or whatever, and we were talking about, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And uh, I was like, you know, we're talking about what that meant. And then my son was like, oh, it's like Mercy Warehouse, you know, um, Mercy Warehouse, right? It's run by uh, the vineyard up there that has, you know, it's this great place where we've gotten a couple things along the way, um, but also happily been able to sort of like give some stuff that we didn't need uh, to it. And so we talked about like, what does it mean to call a place the Mercy Warehouse? What does it mean to, to try to be a place where people um, who maybe don't have a lot of money can, can have things like toys or like furniture or clothes or whatever? Um, and, and a place where, where you give your money and the money itself is gonna be going to help support, bless those who don't have a lot, right? What is mercy? And we talked about what that meant. And again, as my kids are asking these questions or like coming up with these beautiful reflections, I'm in awe. It's wonder. I'm thinking about what the word is saying and how it, it's connecting my daughter's heart, my son's heart, and then my heart. And we're talking about it at breakfast. And, and it's so simple. But if like you don't have that, like if I was like, Meet my moop. Uh, mercy and category. Um, here's the definition. Um, if I was like trying to like, here's the here's the thing, you know. If I was like, gonna try to like encapsulate it and like, there's no reflection, there's no conversation, there's no question. Like that'd be just the opposite. That'd be so weak. Um, and I do that too. I, I do that. Um, but I just know that this category of wonder. Um, you and I, we need to have a life. You need to have a person. You need to be a person. Um, we cannot be so prone as we are to political things. We cannot be so prone. We cannot be so vulnerable to everything. We're so unbelievably vulnerable to people getting all into something or all against something else. Or we're so easily caught up and like animated by whatever the heck is animating people. And it's, it's so small and it's so fleeting and it's, it's just such a narrow way to live. And the word, the word is this opportunity to try to open us up to the fact that everything that the Lord has made is, has wonder in it and that his word itself contains the world. So beginning in that place of wonder as a recovery to try to be a person instead of just an ambition or a person instead of an agenda or a person instead of a, a tribe or a, a politics or a whatever, um, an opinion. Ugh, can you imagine if at the end of your life the Lord's like, yeah, you're not really a person, you're an opinion. You're just an opinion. You'd be like, ugh. It's like, you know, Lewis talking about someone being like just a murmur at the end, just a grumble. They're not even a person anymore, they're a grumble. It's like, oh, jeez. I don't want to be a grumble. <laughs> and I also don't want to just be an opinion. Rah, I had an opinion once. I was all upset all the time. And rah, I want to be a person who obeys the Lord, not out of just sort of, I don't know, fear or not trying to secure some bonus from the genie in the lamp. I want to be a, a person who obeys the Lord out of a sense of wonder, out of a sense of a, the blessing of being able to say, man, the Lord has given me a life. What in, what in the world is that? How did I get this life? How did I get this incredible opportunity to love people? How have I made that so small by being so petty and so harsh or unkind or impatient? I don't want to be at the end of my life and say, the Lord said, you were a grumble. You were a murmur. You were a you were an opinion. I want the Lord to be able to say, you were a person. You were a person. Congratulations. You are a person. I made you a person. You had connections. You had love. You had complex things in your life. You had interests. You were curious about what other people thought. You didn't always talk over them. It wasn't always about your agenda and your stuff and your thoughts. 
Like, I, I, oh, especially in front of my kids. Oh, I just don't want my kids to grow up and be like, well, you know, Dad, he was always a, you know, what was he? He was always a sermon. He was always a, he was always a teaching. He was always a, here's a moral lesson, you know. I want them to be like, he was a person, you know. He was a person. He had stuff going on. He had a life. He was a person. Um, so the central motivation of, of just appreciating the wonder of the word and then the other thing that, that he appreciates here is the accessibility of the word. Because, I mean, when you talk about wonder as a, literally just as a definition, it means something that sort of is beyond grasping. It's beyond your ceiling, right? It's beyond your box. It's past you. And so the sense could be like, man, yeah, I, I mean, I, the word's great, but I'm like, I don't understand it. Like, it's incomprehensible. And there are times when you're open to the word and you're just like, I, know, I got lost in lamentations or something. I feel like I'm not even in the Bible anymore. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like I'm at the second level of hell. Um, like, one of the things that can happen is you can say, well, wonder, yeah, it's amazing, which kind of means I just don't get it. It's just beyond me, right? Like, it's it's too much. But what this almost immediately pivots to is that I don't just appreciate that the word is wonderful, that it's full of wonder, but I really appreciate that it's accessible. I mean, look at the line. It's an incredible sort of flip to just go from wonder to accessibility. He goes, the teaching of your word gives light. That means understanding, illumination, comprehension, right? It's not, it's not totally beyond you, even though it's, if it's category beyond you, right? Even though it's category bursting beyond you. It, it is totally gettable in the sense that, that the Lord will always make it so that you're able to grasp something. You might not grasp everything, but he's like, I can't believe how accessible it is. The teaching of your word gives light. So even the simple can understand. First of all, not one person I've ever met is going to be like, I am, I am the simple. <laughs> Which makes me nervous that any one of us, or maybe all of us, are the simple. Because nobody would self-identify as the simple, I don't think. Although, if you did, fair play. Or else you just have low self-esteem, so you might still be wrong. Um, either way, he goes, the teaching of your word gives light. So even the simple can understand. In other words... This does not require an advanced degree to be blessed by your time in the Word. It does not require, like, I don't know, some meditation month, you know, in a monastery or on a hillside somewhere and some mystical experience to be blessed by the Word. It's like the simple teaching of the Word gives light. And, I mean, you know, I can't say this for sure on Thursdays, but I can, my experience on Sundays is, is that's true. <laughs> you know, like, like, when I hear the Word taught, it gives light. That's what it does. That's just what it's up to. And, and I know, I know that I am among the simple um, and that at any point in my life, at any point in anyone's life, the word will still give light. That astonishes. Now, think about this. That is wonderful to the psalmist. Not just that the word itself is like beyond what we could possibly sort of grasp or reduce or imagine or control, but that even though it's so much bigger than anything we can grasp, imagine, or control anyone can benefit from it anyone can understand it that's incredible that that anyone can be blessed by the very thing that's too much for anyone to fully grasp that is my I, like i mean that is such an incredible sort of thought that is true in 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 so many people's experience the teaching of your word gives light it doesn't just blind but it gives light that, that brings understanding. And how many times have you heard the word taught and you actually are like, okay, that, that makes sense. It confirmed something in your heart or it clarified something or it, or it convicted you of something. All of that is light, my friends, right? Like when your sin gets flushed out of being secret, private, whatever, like say you were turning into an opinion instead of a person or a grumble instead of a person. Um, or a I'm right, or a meet, mop, moop, here's your moral teaching instead of a person. Like, the word can show you that in an instant. It can cut you to the quick. It can convict you. It can say, you are totally fake in front of your kids trying to just show them you have answers. Stop it, you know? Like, in a second, that could happen. That's light. Or, or some deep, dark sin that nobody knows about. You hear a simple teaching from a simple person, and all of a sudden that sin is like raging in the light, and you're like, oh my gosh, i got to deal with that. Or it's going to devour me. That's light. That's light. 
That, that is understanding. You're, you're seeing something that's true. It doesn't mean it's all wonderful, like beautiful, all, oh, oh, delightful. It means it's true. It means it's real. It means it's giving you clarity on something that's real. The word always does that. And it requires no advanced degree for that kind of light to sort of like fall upon you. That's a blessing. That's just the, that's the incredible nature. That's part of the wonder is that it's accessible for absolutely anybody. I mean, and, and sometimes, you know, whatever. But sometimes in contemporary Christianity, we made it like we dumbed everything down. We're just like, we're going to keep it down here. You know, I used to, I joke around like I'm flannels and sandals. And some of my friends are smells and bells, high liturgy, ornate architecture. And I'm over here like, you know, in a, in a garage. I mean, I, I'm literally in a garage. I'm um, like, it doesn't matter where we are, you know, <laughs> anywhere. The Lord doesn't care about the architecture. Like, you know, I come from a world in which you're like all about being the simple, you know, like we're all about being like nothing. We don't need nothing. We don't need nothing. We don't need shoes. But the idea here is it's accessible to everyone. It doesn't mean it keeps you in the place you are. It means wherever you are, you can hear and have the light of the word like show you your life, show you who you are before the living God, reveal God to you. That is an incredible place of wonder that even though you could be an incredible place of rebellion, you hear a simple teaching from the word and it wakes you up. That's incredible. You know what rebellion can do to confuse the mind and make people almost unable to hear? And yet every once in a while, if someone actually runs into the word, they'll be like, uh oh, <laughs> like the word could still get through to someone who's in that place. That's astonishing. That's absolutely astonishing. The teaching of your word gives light. And it, so it, it, it just, no matter what, it's bringing reality, clarity, some conviction, maybe hope, you know, whatever it is, but it's bringing light. It's bringing some kind of truth to your life. And it's accessible at any level from my three year old daughter to you know, I don't know, an 89 year old or, or, you know, with four PhDs, you know, who was a pastor for 70 years. I don't know, something like that, right? Like that there's nobody it's going to miss. There's nobody who gets left out and there's nobody who can't return to it and see more, right? And that's the other thing, because it started with that first part, it's not that until you get familiar with it and then the light gets duller and duller, you know, you've heard it all before. So now it brings you less light because you grew up in the church. So now, you know, you don't have anything else to learn. Let's be honest. You know, all the stories and everything like that. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you could have grown up in the church, heard a sermon every day of your waking life. And if you hear the simple teaching of the word today, tonight, right now, you'll still get light. <laughs> That's astonishing. That's astonishing. You could be a church kid. You could be a pastor's kid. You could be a, I was drowning in the word my whole life and everyone around me. It's all I talk about. Word, 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 word. And you could still, every time it is taught faithfully, every time it is taught faithfully, you will still gain reality, truth, life. The light will be on you. It'll, it'll show you something. The Lord will be faithful. It'll never, what does the scripture say? It'll never return void. That's astonishing. That's astonishing. So that category, wonder of the word, category breaking, full of awe, incredible, beyond, 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 and yet accessible. What an incredible, not paradox, but almost sounds almost like a paradox, but just incredible thing to hold both of those at once. That it's beyond any of us, and yet it's available and accessible to all of us. I mean, that is the very best of everything, the best of all possible worlds, as they used to say. So that place of appreciating the wonder of the word and appreciating the accessibility of the word. And then, hmm, hmm. sorry, just teaching the word does this. You're just like, no, this is so, this is so precious and lovely. Um, and then, and then he's appreciating that the Lord's love leads the Lord to teach us his word. Like he's, he's, he's if you can see the progression, wonder of the word. And then, man, how could somebody, even I, could like everyone can get something from when they hear the word. It's accessible to all of us. And then it's like the teaching of the word. Why does it even happen? It's like, because the Lord loves us. The Lord's love means he teaches us his word. That's astonishing. The Lord's love means he teaches us his word. That's, that's what it means in part for the Lord to love us. That's how it's, the Lord's love is demonstrated to us in that he 
never stops teaching us his word. He says in uh, verse, let's see, look upon me with love, verse 135, look upon me with love, teach me your decrees. In other words, the love that the Lord shows translates into the Lord teaching his decrees, teaching his word. The psalmist is astonished not only that the word is accessible, it brings light, but that that the Lord's love is manifest and that he teaches us. That he doesn't that it's not a game, you know? Like that it's it's that it's not a game. It's not like the Lord is like, well, good luck, you know. There's gonna be serious consequences, but I'm not gonna I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna teach you anything. I'm not gonna help you get there. <laughs> He's like, no, the very love of the Lord is manifest in that he continues to teach us his word. Right? In that sense, like let's say I, I grew up in the church. So let's say I grew up in the church and I was like, Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. It would be like, well, if the Lord's love is manifest in him teaching you the word, then why would you ever want, why would you ever say, hey, Lord, I don't need you to like keep loving me. Like, I already got it. Like, you can stop loving me. <laughs> you know, if the Lord teaches those he loves uh, and, and I feel like I kind of got it and I lost that wonder, like, think about it in that way. You would never want to be like, Lord, I don't need you to keep loving me. Like, stop teaching. Stop teaching me. I, I'm good. I know it. I, you already taught me. You already loved me. Like, I don't, I, like, you know, I don't say to my kids, hey, yeah, I don't, I don't love you today, but I loved you yesterday. You know what I mean? Like, I, I loved you the first three years. So, you know, that's a lot of love. You don't need today's love. Like, you know, I loved you yesterday, right? I loved you Wednesday. Daddy, do you love me? I loved you Wednesday, sweetheart. <laughs> I loved you Wednesday. Like, nobody would be like, yeah, I'm done. I'm good on the Lord's love. I don't need any more of that in my life. But if you realize that the Lord demonstrates his love towards you by teaching you his word, then you would never want to get to a place in life in which you were like, I don't need to be taught his word anymore. Because it would be yoked in your mind, verse 135, it would be yoked in your mind to, he, he teaches his word to those he loves. His love is manifest in that he teaches me. I don't want him to stop loving me. <laughs> I don't want to stop. You know, I don't want him to stop showing me things about himself. I don't want him to stop helping me obey. I don't want him to. I, I don't want to stop that. I don't want him to stop loving me. It's not going to be like, oh, you know, the Lord loved me for twenty-five years. You know, I don't need him to love me for fifty. You know, <laughs> but I think I, we do that. We're like, oh, I got it. I got it. And it's like, no, man. If you thought, if you realize that the Lord, His love is manifest, and that He teaches us, and that He teaches those He loves, and and that that's like a thing you can't escape and separate. Then you'd be like, I never want you to stop teaching me. You'd be like, Peter, you'd probably oversteer. You'd be like, I want you to teach me every minute of the day. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to bathe every moment of my life. I don't even want to sleep anymore. I just want teaching, you know. And he doesn't do that. He's like, whoa, whoa, Peter, take it easy. Like, you just need your feet washed, you know. It's like, relax, you know. But you're going to need your feet washed tomorrow, right? And you're going to need your feet washed on Saturday. And you're going to need your feet washed on Sunday. And gosh darn it, those open-toed shoes, but you're going to need your feet washed on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. In fact, son of a gun, Peter, you're going to need your feet washed every day of your life. You're not going to need a, you know, top-to-bottom overwhelming, you know, dunk, but you're going to need your feet washed every day. You're going to, if you, the Lord is going to need to teach you regularly. He's going to need to wash your feet. He's going to need to love you by teaching you his word every day of your life till kingdom come. And, and it's the same thing as the foot washing, right? What does he say? Wives or husbands love your wives by washing them in the water of the word. You're not like, well, I did that once. It's like, oh, really? So <laughs> you're missing the ancient culture thing, right? Like, they're, like people's feet get dirty every day. If you had that attentiveness to each other, the who's bondi, right? If you were looking at each other like, how can I love this person? How can I love this person today? You wouldn't be like, well, I loved them yesterday. I don't, you know. <laughs> No, you wash them in the water of the word. The Lord washes us in the water of his word. He teaches us his word as an act of love, as an act of foot washing, as a servant love. The psalmist is astonished that the Lord's love manifests and that he teaches us. So we would never want to be done with his love. We would never want to be done with being taught. And that personal love, that personal sort of connection that the Lord has to us in love is also seen in verse 132. Where he says, Lord, sort of show me your mercy, your grace, as you do for all who love your name. As you do for all those you love is actually the more literal translation. That's an interesting flip there in the NLT. Um, I don't think it's purposely misleading there, but um, not the best translation. Uh, as you do for all who, who you love is a little, is a little closer. Um, so he's saying, 
you manifest your love in teaching and you manifest your love not just in teaching like like I teach like I teach you know like especially when I used to teach at college you go into a room maybe an auditorium right maybe you got 200 people um, I can think of a couple contexts in which I had like a bunch of people big stadium seating you know at UCI you know it's not it's not cool because it's very nerdy like you can't be like yeah I made it it's like all right for a few people like who are really nerded out that might be like really cool but for most people they're like whatever either way I remember standing in front of a couple hundred you know kids teaching them stuff but I didn't like know them you know I was like there's 200 people I'm like I don't know any of these people but I gave them my best you know I was like hey you know here and this that and the other thing poetry or whatever and uh you know and some, nobody applauded I mean I, it was fine you know some people wrote interesting essays and stuff but I didn't have like a personal connection like teaching doesn't necessarily imply Right, we can think of modes of teaching that are not personal. They're not like whatever, right? But that's not that's not the truth of the Lord, right? Like I, I've taught probably thousands of college kids in my like ten years at UCI, um, and I remember a handful. And I had conversations that maybe were you know powerful or uh, you know personal in some way with a few, but with the Lord, he he is personal with everyone he teaches. With everyone he loves, he is personal in the way he reveals himself to them. So the psalmist is saying in 132, show me your mercy as you do for all those you love. Like that's part of what he does is he doesn't just teach from a distance. He doesn't just walk into an auditorium and say, you know, here's what Psalm 119 is all about. Good luck, everybody. Um, but his, his life is bound up with those he loves. He reveals himself personally to those he loves. It's not just factums, right? It's not just information. It's not just this led to this and this led to this, like some kind of histories are written, right? It doesn't, it's not just about stuff, but it's a personal way of interacting with us where he shows us. Uh, for writers, they used to always say, show, don't tell. Someone who tells is like, they kind of say everything that needs to be said, but they just sort of explain it all. It's not a good teacher, and it's not a good writer that just tells. But the idea is that a good teacher and a good writer will show. They'll kind of say, well, what does it look like? What does it look like? So like a good novelist is someone who can bring you into a scene, a family in a living room and all their little like idiosyncrasies and the kind of the tensions and some of the looks and the thoughts that are going on and just sort of the, the incredible sort of drama of ordinary life, right? By showing you how somebody sort of lifts their coffee or how they kind of, <laughs> how they kind of half smile to someone over here, how their eyes kind of almost roll when someone says something and no one thinks they're, they don't think they're being seen by someone, right? When you show, like a good novelist or, or a good filmmaker, obviously, when you show life, when you show something, um, it's much more resonant than being like, yeah, you know, families, you know, families can be weird. Families can have ticks and, you know, people can be up to their own thing in families. And you're like, all right, I, yeah, of course, sure. But when you show a family. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of Tolstoy here, the opening of Anna Karenina. Um, when you show, right, all, all happy marriages are the same. All unhappy marriages are like unbelievably unique. They're unhappy in their own way, right? And, you know, obviously that's tongue in cheek. But the idea is like when something's off, like it's really complicated. <laughs> and so Tolstoy's are the master of showing you, not just being like, well, you know, people. Like, that's that wonderlessness, right? Is that a word? Wonderlessness is just explaining. Ah, you know, you know, there's, you know how people work. But showing. And so when you think about the Lord, not just telling. Do this. Do that. Also do this. And you're like, okay, you got it, boss, you know. Uh, you know, in fair play, if that's what we had, we'd go with that. But the psalmist knows we have more. He knows that the Lord desires to reveal himself in a personal way to those he loves. That he shows himself. He shows up. He appears. What do we read in John chapter 1? He came into the flesh, right? He came into his own. His own did not receive him, but he like walked among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's showing. That's revealing. That's approaching us in mercy and love and grace and compassion, right? I was thinking, I was praying um, last night for Haddon to fall asleep. <laughs> that could be almost any night, but I was praying last night. Because Lisa wasn't here, and so I had like I had to really focus my prayers. So I was like, normally we got like double barrel prayers, you know, like, Ch -ch -ch, please Lord, please let him fall asleep. 
it's probably not the best image for prayer, but um, but I was like, oh, I am the I gotta have like I gotta double down on my prayers because I don't have like my prayer partner, you know, to beg the throne of God for my child to fall asleep. Um, and so I was like really praying, and I had this thing in my head. This happens to me every once in a while. I'll be like, wow, this is so small. It's so petty, right? It feels so tiny. And what is it? It's it's a little selfish. I'm like, yeah, I want him to fall asleep, but it's because I want to fall asleep. It's really a prayer for me, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, please, Lord, look upon your servant with grace. And so, like, I'm praying and I'm thinking, this is so... And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm like, this is such a small thing and there, it, it's selfish in some ways and it's petty and, and, he, and he... I shouldn't be like... I'm like, why am I not praying for salvation? Like, I'm a, I get all pastor about it. I'm like, what? Uh, and I almost stop. And then I'm like, and then I'll be like, all right, uh, can you just send? And I'll be like, <laughs> in my prayer, I'll be like, can you just send an angel? Like, I don't want to bother you. And I know it's kind of selfish. I'm really praying for myself to be able to sleep tonight. Um, but could you just dispatch like his, I don't know where his guardian angel is, but there is that verse. And so I'm like, if he's around, if he could just sort of like, shh, if he could just do an angel, I don't know how it works. I'm imagining things, you know, if you could just send, if you, I don't know what his guardian angel is distracted, but if you could just send it, if you don't have to bother Lord. Anyway, so my prayers are going through all these weird things because I'm like, this is so small and every baby on the planet, you could pray this for every baby on the planet every night. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. This is insane. Right. And then like I had this moment in this prayer because he really was having trouble. And I had this moment and I thought, and I just had this image of Jesus being uh, with us, not like in my house here, but Jesus being with us in the scripture and that he would just like see people with compassion who are sick. Just people with fevers, you know, people who are just sick, people who were just sick, people who were just physically sick. And he didn't do the pastor. Well, you know, you <laughs> he didn't rebuke them. You're like, yeah, you have a fever, but you know, the real fever is in your soul. You know, he didn't like, he didn't come at them. He just looked at them with compassion. And like time and again, you read in the Gospels, he just sort of like take half a day and just pray and he just heal the sick. Just heal them. And a lot of them, they never know who he is. They just, they thank you so much. You know, they get a good rest, you know, that night or something. And I was just struck in that moment that like he really does care about every single baby who's having a tummy ache. And I'm just like, that is wonderful it is category shattering i don't have that category so i keep like apologizing through a prayer to just be like just this once even though it's selfish and i know there's a lot of babies in the world um he he really saw everybody and he get, had compassion on everybody and that is astonishing and so i you know it's like when you when you see that the lord doesn't just tell you what to do but he, he reveals himself. He shows up in the world. He shows up in your life. He shows up and he shows you. He shows up in mercy. Oh, man. He shows up. That was what we were talking about this morning at breakfast. The blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. The Lord will show mercy to them. How merciful has he been to you? He shows you mercy. He shows you his grace. He doesn't give you what you deserve. He is kinder to you than you ever deserve. That's a, that's a working definition of mercy. He's kinder to you than you deserve. And he is he's always kinder to you than you deserve. And so he doesn't just teach us from a distance. He doesn't just give us a way to live and then leave the auditorium. He, um, he shows up. He, he reveals himself. He, he is close. Wherever you are right now, he, he really is... There, I can say that, and I know it can sound like just a preacherly thing to say. And again, I got in my own head about it last night, praying for my son to be able to fall asleep. But the Lord got me through and out of my own stupid head to be like, uh, don't fool yourself. I care more than you understand I could possibly care. Like, don't put your stupid little thought limit on the fact that I care about every single child, every single night, all the time. That they... He's not me, and he, he doesn't have some limited capacity of care and um, attention. So the psalmist is astonished. He says, you know, I, I just appreciate the Lord. I, I, I appreciate how wonderful his word is. I, I appreciate 
that it's accessible to everyone. I appreciate it so much that it's not just there as a thing, but it's his love for us. It's why he teaches us his work. And that his teaching is not separate from the fact that he shows up in our lives in merciful and compassionate ways. I just so appreciate the Lord, and that motivates the psalmist. It, it actually stirs something in the psalm. It starts to stir something because true, true appreciation will stir true desire. It starts to stir this desire. It's almost uncomfortable how powerful the desire is described. One verse one thirty one. I pant with expectation. It's sort of like an animal. Uh, we sing a song as a deer panteth for the water. It's like an animal. I don't know if you ever like watch Planet Earth and you see like. You know, David Attenborough is like, and, you know, the, the four-horned rhinoceros spends its entire life trying to find one drop of water. <laughs> it's like, well, you watch an animal walk for weeks to try to find, like, a creek, you know? And, um, and it's like the whole goal of the animal's life is like, same thing as yesterday looking for water. What are you doing, Fred? Same thing I did yesterday. Also looking for water. All right, see you in 20 years. Hey, Fred, what are you up to? Looking for water. That's right. Uh, like literally <laughs> as a deer, as an animal pants for water, in other words, hoping not to die today, as an animal pants for water. So my soul, right? So I long for your word. Okay, so true appreciation. This is the connection. True appreciation stirs true desire. I could give you a dumb example to get us in. Um, I remember the first time Lisa and I, <laughs> I remember the, uh, okay, I remember the first time Lisa and I saw a double stroller. Uh, we had only had one child and she was pregnant with a second child. And I remember we saw a double stroller Honey, if you're watching this at some point, you, I think you remember this. Uh, we saw a lady with a double stroller, and we're like, <laughs> we, I don't remember if we pulled over if we already parked. We were parked, I think we were parked at our house, uh, the little apartment in San Clemente. And, uh, and I remember being like, I don't know if Lisa and I said something, but I remember it was like the vibe was like, hey, I'm about to get weird. And I go, I'm going to go, we saw a lady with a double stroller, and she did some magical thing, and she was like, Whoo -hoo -hoo, and it like transformed into something that she just put into her car by herself. And we were like, and we are like, oh my gosh. And it was like a city select whatever. And I go up to her and I go, hey, don't mean to be weird. And as a guy, I'm like pointing at like, hey, I have a wife right there and we have a child. Like I'm not, I'm not whatever a guy might be, right? A horrible person. Um, hey, I at least have a wife and a kid. Um, so I know I'm super random walking up to you here, but whatever you just did and whatever that is, it's amazing. Can you tell me about that stroller? <laughs> The lady's like, oh, sure, this is the one you want. I had this one, and she's just like, she's on it. It was like mom talking to a dad, knowing that another mom was waiting for the uh, the 411, you know? And uh, and I'm like, thank you so much. I don't even get her name. I was just like, thank you so much, solidarity, right? Like, we can do this. And I like, go back to my car, and I'm like, all right, it's called a city select. <laughs> it's a city, here's what she said, and this is where it locks in, and you can just move, you can just have, this is how it works. And then my friends appreciation stirred desire <laughs> and I was like all right so that's what we got to get we got to get a city select that can have the double thing so that we can transform that thing and we can super parent uh, at every level of life true appreciation stirs true desire and so when the psalmist goes through all of these things that he appreciates about the word about the Lord about the word about the Lord about the Lord and his word and the word and the Lord all of a sudden, it's just like, he's just like, I'm like hungry, thirsting, starving, panting like an animal for water. Like I am, I am like, now that I am like thinking and, and now that I am appreciating and, and just recounting the beauty and the wonder of the word and the Lord and his love, 
the desire gets stirred up. It gets incredibly stirred up, which is so awesome. True appreciation stirs true desire. If you lack desire for the word, it's because you lack appreciation of the word, right? You can always kind of reverse these things and help yourself kind of maybe get out of a stuck place. If you're lacking desire to be in the word or for prayer or something like that, it's because you're missing something. You're not appreciating what prayer really is or you're not appreciating what the word really is or who the Lord really is. Because if you do appreciate him in those ways or you do appreciate his word in that way or you appreciate what prayer is as, as what he has given it, you're going to desire it. It's going to stir desire. True appreciation stirs true desire. And then the psalmist says, now he's getting into it. And he's like, I need you now in my life Guide my steps by your word. Establish me in your word. Not just big ideas, beautiful ideas. Yes, more personhood, great, big life. But also today, ordinary, day-to-day, frustration, challenge, uh, you know, I don't know, feeling weird about myself. Did Did that sound stupid? I think that sounded stupid again. Did I say that? Do I look like that? What is happening to me? Right? Just weird life stuff. People, other people, relationships, whatever it is that you're navigating. He's like, I need you here. I need you to guide me here. And he's thinking about desire, and he's like, I have this desire for your word, and I need your word to guard and guide my steps so that, frankly, I'm preserved from other kinds of desires. Evil desires, for example, right? Guide my steps by your words so I will not be overcome by evil. You're like, whoa, where'd that come from? Uh, Well, because, as you know, sometimes you don't have a desire for the word. You have a desire for selfish gain. You have a desire for lustful pleasure. You have a desire for greed. You have a desire for whatever. You have a desire for something that's not good, not the Lord, right? So he's like, stir the desire, the appreciation, guard, now guide my steps, establish my steps, help me to walk in obedience to your word, which will guard me, because I don't want these other desires that are always after me, competing, tempting, right? Think of Jesus' parable of the sower. You know, the seed, the word gets out there, and people are like, yeah, interesting. And then the sun comes, and he's like, ah, and the roots are shallow, and the person's like, ah, life's too much. <laughs> and they just disappear from the word, right? Or the enemy, like the crow, snatches it out of your heart as soon as it gets there. Right? Like, I'm speaking a word, and it's like getting in your heart, and then like, the enemy will be like, nope, and he'll just take it away. Or the thorns and the thistles, right? The worries and cares of this life will choke the word out of your life. So the psalmist thinking about desire, thinking about appreciation, is also thinking about the drama of desire. And he's like, guard my steps, guide my steps in your word to keep me from evil desire, for, to keep me being overcome by other kinds of desires that would choke the word out of my life, that would snatch it from my heart, or that would burn me up and wither these little small roots that are just starting to form, right? He's like, I need you to guide me so that the evil does not come in and steal this out of my life. It's not enough just here. I have to actually put into play. I have to follow through. I can't just sit and desire. I have to follow through. Appreciation leads to desire. Desire needs to lead to to obedience, needs to lead to a life, needs to lead to a way of living that actually tracks with the Lord. So he's like, keep me from evil by helping me walk this out, following through. Evangelicals, we got really good at knowing our Bibles, talking about our Bibles, defending our Bibles, not actually, oh no, not actually following through, and living uh, the Sermon on the Mount, for example. Um, So like we we come up short a lot of times when it comes to actually walking this out. So he's like, guide my steps by your word, so I will not be overcome by evil. And then and then and then he also recognizes that he's already mm, entangled. Um, He's entangled already. And so he's like, ransom me from the oppression of others or from people then I can obey your commandments. This line in 134 is very interesting. Ransom me from the oppression of human beings. And sometimes the oppression is not just uh, evil people who are doing evil things, but the oppression is subtle. It's like the oppression of like influence that is not healthy. It's like, you know, someone's just sort of, uh, I don't know, toxic or whatever we, word you would use. Um, but the word here is also a word that often is used in the scripture for extortion. Uh, ransom me because of, for, from those who would extort me, extort you. It's almost like people know you well enough to hold it against you. You know how like um, sometimes, again, family, friends, spouses, um, you know people so well that you like, it's like you hold each other ransom. It's like extortion. It's like, well, yeah, you were nice today, but let's not freak, let's not kid ourselves. 25 years of being a horrible, horrible shrew. You know, that's not going to get wiped out because you bought me ice cream. You know, you're like, geez, Louise, I was just trying to 
have a good day buying you ice, having fun hanging out with you and getting ice cream. And, but a lot of times when we know each other so well, we oppress each other, we can extort each other by holding the past against each other like ransom, like we hold each other ransom. What an interesting thing that in God's eyes, he'll forgive us of our sins. In our eyes, we keep ledgers and books. Like so many of the scriptures that talk about sin being washed away is about a record being blotted from the book, right? I will remember their sins no more, erase their sin from the ledger. And yet a lot of times in our human relationships, because this is talking about the oppression that you feel from people, in our human relationships, we don't forget anything. We're like, yeah, but there was that other time. And we hold each other like ransom based on the past. So even if the Lord is like forgiven us to free us to live a new, new life, new future, we're like, yeah, but I didn't forget, right? Like we hold each other almost like extortion. It's almost like, that's an incredibly powerful word. So he's like, look, where I'm entangled with things or where I'm entangled where my sin, maybe your sin speaks to you and it's like, you're, you're not that good. Okay, yeah, you're walking with the Lord now, but think about the person you were. Think about how you treated people. Think of the things you did. Think, just think about the things you've done. Right, your sin will hold you ransom. Right, if you let it, uh, evil. Right, that that's what the enemy would want you to do. He want your sin, which has been forgiven in Christ. If you have placed your hope in Jesus, your sin will hold you ransom, even though it's not true. And we'll hold each other ransom because we won't forgive each other in the way Christ does. We'll, we'll actually we'll keep the books on each other. Spouses will keep the books on each other. Um, you know, family members will keep the books on each other. Our old friends will keep the books on each other. It always kind of like, no. Was... Um, and the psalmist says, look, ransom me from that. Like, rescue me from, from a life lived in, like, patterns of oppression and extortion through my relationships. Rescue me from unhealthy ties in which people will not let me move forward or not let me change or, or will not let me forget anything. And so I keep living with this oppressive weight of the past it's like ransom me from that oppressive weight so that I can obey you, so I can like see clearly. Like even if the Lord has said certain things, real life is bound up with the drama of people not forgiving you or forgetting. And so the Lord's like calling you forward, but the psalmist is like, can you help me? I'm like, I'm still being like, you know, I still got like people like pulling on my clothes or I got the past or I got my worries or my, my ancient regrets like pulling on me from the past. Can you, can you ransom me out of this oppression? <laughs> like, I want to obey you. I want to follow you. My desire was stirred. I, my appreciation for who you are and who you're, what your word is stirred a true desire but I, I got all these things that are like all these hands that are grabbing me from the past, all these things that are binding me, or at least that feel like they're binding me. Can you please, can you please free me from that? And, you know, this psalm comes before the, the, the redemption of Jesus. So this psalm is literally true, right? There is no true forward-looking forgiven future for someone until the blood of Christ has has basically covered them and cut those ties to the past. But if you're a Christian, when you were baptized, the Lord broke the ties of people not forgetting. That broke the ties of your sin and your past being held against you. Even if people act like it still should be held against you. Even if that's true, Jesus Christ has already fulfilled that verse. He has ransomed you from that oppression. He has ransomed you from your worries that you're going to become what you were or you're going to become whatever you were raised by or you're going to become what you hate or what you fear or you're going to become what people think of you or you're going to become... Jesus has freed you from that. He has ransomed you from that so that you can obey him. Whom the Lord has set free, he is free indeed. Right? Think of what Paul says to the Galatians. Don't go back. What are you doing? Don't go back. What, how could you go back, you foolish Galatians? You've been set free. Christ has set you for the freedom which Christ has set you free. You're supposed to live in freedom. So the psalmist is longing for that moment. Christian, you experience that. That's true of your life. Do not be bound by your past or by the oppression of other people and what they say or think or remember about you or hold against you or guilt or shame or whatever it is. 
You have been ransomed from that by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the resurrection is all about, is new life through that resurrection ransom. That blood paid that price. It cut those ties. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. All right, I'm home. I'm free. Verse 136. Because this is all so good, because this is all so true, because this is all so beautiful, is full of wonder, it breaks the heart of the psalmist to think of those who don't see it. it. It should break the heart of any of us who realize how beautiful the Lord is, how wonderful the word is. It should break our hearts that other people don't see it. It should break our hearts that people turn away from the Lord. It shouldn't be like, well, you know, everyone makes their choice. It should matter so much that it breaks your heart that people turn away from the Lord and they don't trust in him. What does he say? It's the last line. Rivers of tears gush from my eyes. You're like, that's, that's pretty dramatic, dude. But, but follow it, because people disobey you. Like, is there anything worse than knowing that people could have the love and the wonder and the freedom and the protection and the goodness and the personhood and the salvation that Jesus has brought into this world and they turn away. Is there anything worse than that? Is there anything more tragic than that? Is there anything more heartbreaking than that? Uh, the short answer is no. That is the single saddest thing in the realm of human experience that someone would not see, that they would refuse to see, refuse to listen, refuse to experience, refuse to receive the wonder and the beauty and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That is the saddest thing that could ever happen. It's sadder than wars and rumors of wars. It's more heartbreaking than any political movement succeeding or failing. It's, it's more heartbreaking than any business venture or economy succeeding or failing. It's more heartbreaking than any of your personal little hopes or dreams succeeding or failing. The most devastating thing in the realm of human experience is that somebody would not see the wonder, the beauty, the forgiveness, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to close in this prayer, in the spirit of that verse, that this isn't just about you or I appreciating and being stirred up in our desire to obey and to follow through and to love and to stay close to the Lord and to celebrate the Lord, but that we would also be attentive in the way that James Harriet was attentive to the farmer in, in the town, in the village, in the place, in the ordinary circumstances of life. Um, just a call, a last call here. Who in your life, maybe you feel hostility, maybe you feel frustration, maybe you feel annoyance, maybe you've become indifferent or cold toward, but who in your life would the Lord say you should rightly have your heart broken because they are not seeing the Lord for who he is? Who is that person or who are those people I'm going to pray that your heart would be softened toward those people, and I'm going to pray directly for those people, and we all have those people. So for all of the beauty and the wonder, this isn't just about me. I want my kids, I want my kids more than anything in the whole universe, I want my kids to know this is true. Not just be told, not meet my mope, dad said a thousand times because that was his job. I want my kids to know the Lord. I want them to, to know the wonder and the beauty of his word, the forgiveness of Jesus, the freedom of a new life in Christ. And I'm, I don't want to pray for them every single day, every single night, not just that they'll fall asleep. I want to pray for their, their lives with the Lord. I want to pray for their souls. Whoever that person is, whoever those people are, I'll, we're going to pray for those people right now. So let's pray. Let's close together. Lord Jesus, all of these things are true. And everyone who's heard the word tonight, or whenever they hear it, has had some light dawn. I don't know what exactly or what way, Spirit, 
has moved, but I know that everyone who hears the word faithfully taught the light of the word, not the goodness of the preacher, but the light of the word is theirs. I pray among those lights, there will be a light, a spotlight, a soft spotlight on the people in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, our friend circles who don't know you, who have turned away from you. Maybe they did know you, but they've walked away, who are not fully resting in your forgiveness, in your beauty, in your wonder, but, but maybe are fearful or anxious or angry or bitter. I pray, Lord, that first our hearts would soften towards them because they tend to be people who are challenging for us because they're so close to us. I pray that our hearts would soften toward them even now, that our hearts would be as the psalmist heart, that it would be broken. It would be broken in the right ways, not for places because they've offended us or hurt us or bothered us, but because of what they are not seeing about you. That you would break our hearts in the right way, not for selfish motive or old pains, but because of what could be theirs but is not yet. And then I pray for those people right now. I know everybody is thinking of a somebody, and there's a name and there's a face, and yet that name, that face, or those names and those faces, those are people that you brought into this world on purpose. Those are people that you love. Those are people who are full of wonder. Those are people who have every chance to know you, to see your love, and to love you in return. Those are people that you died for. And I pray, Lord, even if someone's heard this a thousand times, I pray that something would change and something would crack and something would open. And those who have wandered away would come home to you. Not come home to our expectations, not come home to what we want things to look like, but that they would truly come home to you. That they would know you. That they would see in you something that is not small, but is beautiful and is life-changing and is so personal and is so near and is always teaching and is always forgiving and is always guiding and is always showing grace and mercy and is always bringing us into a, a better future and a better hope. I pray for those people who need to know you right now. I pray that they would know you, that they would receive you, and that they would walk with you. And I pray for your church, Lord, this little church, Zoe, and anybody who's gathering right now just in your name. I just pray that you would strengthen us, Lord, that you would stir in us this appreciation for you that motivates us, that stirs a desire for you, that stirs a an actionable life that's lived for you, that follows through, not because we need to accomplish something, but because we're just full of wonder, and we're just so grateful, and because you're so beautiful and you're so kind. I thank you for these people, and I thank you so much that you let Haddon sleep so that I could teach the word tonight. What a kind thing you just did, Lord. Um, I love you so much, and I pray that anyone who doesn't know your love would know it now. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my little boy. I don't know if you can see him. He's all tucked up. Little. <laughs> He's right there. He's tucked up. He's got a little buns up. <laughs> he got a little buns up. Oh, he's got a little tiggy in there, too. He's so cozy wozy, my little hatty wax. Anyway, before I devolve into... Uh, uh, baby speech, um, which I love, by the way. Um, I'll try to have a little self-respect left in the tank and uh, close. <laughs> I love you guys. Um, I pray. Uh, I pray that the wonder of the word and the wonder of the Lord would be yours <laughs> this week and every week, and it would stir a desire to just know Him better, follow, follow through with what He shows you, and trust Him more and more. And I pray that people who who don't know Him will come to know Him in ways that will add to the wonder. Thank you guys so much for, for being patient with me always and uh, for hanging in there. Um, much love to all of you. I love seeing the names, Daniel, Tyrone, Stephen, Emily. I love seeing my people out there. And I just love 
I love that we get to know the Lord together. So God bless you, everybody. As always, if you have to go, go in peace and God go with you.